All right, get your Bible out to Matthew, Matthew chapter 16. We're going to be looking at Matthew chapter 16 today. Lots to get into. Uh, chapter 16 has some good stuff in it. Chapter 17 has some good stuff in it. And chapter 18 has got some good stuff in it. So I'm really looking forward to these next couple of weeks. Here's your outline for Matthew chapter 16. Verse 1 through 4, the Pharisees show up and they demand signs. Gee, I wonder why. Well, the Jews seek after a sign. Um, verse 5 through 12, the false doctrine of the apostates. The Pharisees and the Sadducees were apostates. And they had false doctrine, and Jesus warned of their false doctrine. Verse 13 through 20 is Peter's confession. He confesses that Jesus is the Christ. That's a wonderful confession. Now, does that save us today, just to believe that Jesus is the Christ? No, that's the gospel for them at that time. Our gospel is to trust in what Jesus did for us. But there will be a time when people need to believe that again in the tribulation. Verse 21 through 23, Jesus prophesies his death burial and resurrection. So he literally tells them, this is what's going to happen. And Peter goes, uh-uh, I can't wait to show you what Jesus said to Peter. Because he, I mean, can you imagine telling God, no, you're wrong. I mean, that doesn't work out too well for anyone to tell Jesus he doesn't know what he's talking about. But anyway, always open his mouth and certain his foot, old Peter. Then verse 24 through 28, Jesus tells them to take up their cross and follow him. And a lot of people love that verse for today. But is that doctrinally for today or is that, I mean, again, we can always spiritually apply passages, right? But a lot of what we're reading is Jesus, a Jew, speaking to Jews. So we're going to look at signs, false doctrine, and Jesus today. And there's a lot to get into. Remember last week, and I didn't really get into it as much as I want to because we've talked about it before. But in Matthew chapter 15, verse 24, But he answered and said, I am not sent but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. So remember that in the chapter before, Jesus says, my ministry is only to Jews. And the apostles' ministry in the beginning was only to Jews because they could have accepted the Messiah. This would have happened and then Jesus would have sat on earth. So remember that. So doctrinally, what we're reading is to Jews only. Now, can we spiritually apply some of it to us? Yes, but not all of it. You have a hard time doing that if it says cut your right hand off, <laughs> if it offends you. That's not grace. That's not for today. So remember, that was for Jews. Over here is for Jews. Now, we're in the church age. Is the church age for Jews and Gentiles? Yeah. As a matter of fact, it's for Jew and Gentile. Mostly Gentiles are getting saved today. But a Jew can be saved today too, right? Of course. And we want them to be saved. But a lot of the Jews, they reject Jesus Christ as their Messiah. Now, how about the Old Testament law? Well, that was given to Moses for the Jews. But could a Gentile get under that law too? That would be called a Jewish proselyte. And that was someone that said, hey, I want to convert to Judaism because those are the chosen people of God and I want to follow that law. So I just wanted to write that up there. So remember, what we're seeing today is Jesus in his earthly ministry as a Jew talking to Jews. And so doctrinally, all this is to Jews. Now, can we spiritually apply some of it? We'll see as we go through. So let's get started here in verse 1. And there's two groups here. There's the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And I don't know how much I'll, I'll talk about them, but just so you know, they were the ruling class. Okay, There was a thing in Israel called the Sanhedrin. And there were 70 of them. It's kind of like our Congress. And they were consisting of Sadducees and Pharisees. So that's your Democrats, Republicans, if you will, in those days. And they were basically the same. They, they all believed in one God. They believed the law was given by that God to Israel. They believed that, except for the Sadducees. They did not believe in the afterlife. They denied the resurrection of the dead. Hey, if you would close that door over there, just in case that's getting too much light in here. I don't know. So the Sadducees did not believe that you rose again from the dead. That's why they're called Sadducees, because they were sad, you see, right? You get a bad joke. But it, so the Sadducees were like, well, there's, there's a denomination in the world today that's kind of like that. They're called the Jehovah Witnesses. And they believe that when you die, that's the end of you. They call that annihilationism or annihilation of the soul. So they believe when you die, you cease to exist. Why would you have a religion if you believe that? If that's true, there's no judgment and you never give account of yourself to God. So then what does it matter? Man, I'm going to go fornicate. I'm going to go rape. I'm going to go pillage. I'm going to go rob some banks. I mean, why? It doesn't matter. <laughs> it does matter. There is a God. So I don't understand how a person could be a Sadducee and not believe that someday 
you would rise from the dead and give account to God at the judgment. To me, that's like total liberal, right? Total. Why would they even follow the law if they didn't believe there's any repercussion? Well, they believe that the repercussion was while you were alive. If you followed the law, you'd be blessed. If you didn't, you'd be cursed while you were alive. But then when you die, there's nothing. Okay, go kill yourself then. I mean, what do they have to offer? Nothing. So that's one of the reasons why Jesus didn't like that crowd, because they felt like they didn't have to give account to anybody. They were like sister better than you. You know, they thought they were way up here and everybody else was down here. And then the Pharisees were just your, a lot of them were the priests and, um, they were actually, well, I have so much in my head, I guess I got to get it out. There were actually three groups back then in the time of Jesus. The Pharisees, the Sadducees, and the Essenes. And it's hard to say that. The Essenes or something like that. And they were like cuckoo. They were really way off. They were so into the law that they went overboard. So, <laughs> so you have the three main groups in that time. And these were the main ones, though, that ruled in the Sanhedrin. And they were the ones that were against Jesus. Well, so far, they haven't believed Jesus. All they've done is accuse Jesus. So they don't like him at all. So here they come to Jesus, and here's what they say. The Pharisees also with the Sadducees came, and tempting desired him that he would show them a sign from heaven. So well, the first thing they did was they came to him and, and accused him of blasphemy. <laughs> then they wanted you know, to kill him, and then they accused his disciples. Now they're saying, okay, all right, fine. You say your Just show us a sign from heaven. All right. Now, I don't like to talk about movies. All right. But there was a movie I remember as a kid and I don't even know what the name of it was, but it cracked me up so much. It had that one guy in it. Um, I can't even remember his name, but he his wife died. And in the movie, he prays and he says, oh, God, I don't know if I should get remarried. If you don't want me to get remarried, just show me a sign. And right then an earthquake took place and the house was shaking and the pictures on the wall were spinning like that. And he looks around and he goes, just any old sign. <laughs> he totally ignored the sign. I thought that was so funny. I don't even know what that movie was, but that, I, I still think that's funny. But they come to him and they're tempting him. Now, who else tempted Jesus? Well, that would be the devil in Matthew chapter 4. And you could read that in verse 1 and 3. So the devil tempts Jesus. So I've always wondered, did they have the devil in them? I mean, one of the groups didn't even believe that you give account to God for your sins. So, I mean, it sounds like it'd be very easy for them to be Satanists. You think maybe there's some Satanists in charge in high places? <laughs> you know, hmm, no. So I was just, it's, I read that and I said, wow, they're tempting him. They tempted him. So they said, I want to see a sign from heaven. Now, has God ever shown a sign from heaven? A lot. You read through the Old Testament, you see all sorts of things. One of the signs was God turned time backwards, it seems like, because the, the sun went backwards. Well, when Jesus was born, there was a sign in heaven. How did they miss that one? So they're saying, hey, just give us another one. <laughs> it's like they're seeing it and they're like, don't look at that. Show me another, you know. <laughs> when we went to, uh, on our trip, we stopped at an antique store and there was the little three monkeys. See no evil, hear no evil, speak no evil. And then one was like this, one was like this, one was like, I'll have to put that on, on the YouTube and show you that picture. But that's just to me, that's what the Pharisees are like, you know. But they're wanting to see a sign from heaven, but they already saw a sign. Now, why would they want a sign? Well, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 22, what does it say? The Jews require a sign. All the way back to Moses when he showed up, God says, you're going to go to them, you're going to tell them that I told you something, and they're not going to believe you. So here's the two signs so that they'll believe. What were they? Do you remember what the two signs were? He took his hand and he put it in. He pulled it out. It was leprous. Put it in and it was clean. And then he had a staff. And we should have brought that snake with us, Laura. I could have used that as an illustration. We got a, a little stuffed snake at a garage sale. And he took his um, uh, baston in Spanish. What is that in English? His cane. and uh, Not cane, but his staff. And he put the staff down and it turned into a snake. And then he picked it up and it turned back in. So when he came, he came with signs because the Jews won't believe without a sign. So here is Jesus' big chance to finally make the Pharisees and Sadducees believe. But they're tempting him. Does Jesus have to give in to a temptation? No. He doesn't have to do anything for those people because they've already shown that they don't care, that they don't believe, that they don't want him. As a matter of fact, they want to kill him. So Jesus can see their heart. They're not really seeking. He could have given another sign, though, for the rest of the people that were there, but he didn't. So they came seeking a sign. Now, a sign from heaven. Hmm. 
What does that mean? A constellations? Meteor? Falling star? Eclipse? I mean, what are the signs in heaven? Have there ever been any signs in heaven that are for the Jews? Now, I don't have time to get into all of that, but there is a thing called the red moons. And I don't know if you've ever looked into that. The red moons. Back in 1492, when I say 1492, what do you think? Columbus, Columbus sailed the ocean blue. Well, while Columbus was leaving, 1492 was when the Jews were expulsed out of Europe. 1492, 1493, all of the people in Europe said, we don't want the Jews. Get rid of them. So they were all kicked out at that time. And there was four tetrad blood moons in the sky during that time. It's like every time something is happening for Israel, there's a sign in heaven. So they're asking for a sign, and Jesus says, well, I'm going to give you 2,000 years of signs, if you'll look. What happened in around 1946, 47? Well, Israel became a nation in 1948, and there just happened to be four blood moons, a sign in the heaven, right? Right before that, marking, hey, Israel, you're about to get a land. In 1967, there was what's called the Six Days War. Have you ever heard of the Six Days War? There was a war and Israel was attacked on both sides and then Israel actually gained land from all that. And guess what happened around that time? Four blood, I mean, just a coincidence, right? Why was it called the Six Days War? Because they're supposed to rest on the Sabbath. Did you know that war ended just in time for them to go rest on the Sabbath day? Was that God or was that an accident? Well, I think maybe that was the Lord. And so throughout history, there's been signs in heaven for these people. Uh, recently, there was the tetrad blood moons around 2015, 2014, 2015. Anything happened around that time? Well, there was a September 23rd, 2017. There was a sign in heaven. And in 2018, May, when they, you know, the actual, uh, was it the 70th year anniversary of them? Or was it was close. Yeah, it was. It was the 70th year anniversary of Israel. Trump declared the capital of Israel as Jerusalem. And yet there was a sign preceding that in heaven. Anything to that? Well, and remember, that, that was there like two years, remember? Because they tried to kill Jesus uh, and all the babies aged two. So there was something about two years. So it shows up around 2015. Two years later was that thing in heaven in 2017. And in 2018, big deal for the Jews. Now what's happening in Israel? There's a war. Do you know this is like 50 years after the last big war? Was it the Yom Kippur War that was in, in 1973? And here we are. What's, what's 50? A jubilee? Mm -hmm. so, so all these signs in heaven. And everybody's like, no, that land belongs to Palestine. It's like, why aren't you looking up there and looking down in the Bible? You would see that God has something prepared for this people and he's not done with them. But it's just amazing to me that they come looking for a sign from heaven and then it's like they're like this. Just show us. Come on, just show me. You know, they're not wanting to look. And yet for 2000 years, there have been sign after sign after sign. What about this eclipse that's coming over America? On August 21st, 2017, there was an eclipse that went across America and went whoosh, just like that. Well, on April 8th, 2024, there's another one. It's going to go whoosh, just like this and it's making a cross. Is that God in heaven going, I'm done with this country? <laughs> I hope not, but it's amazing that these things are happening and there's exactly seven years apart. Interesting. And, and one of those eclipses went across seven different cities named Salem, which means peace. So is there anything to this? No, no, nothing to see here, right? Or maybe there is a God in heaven that does show signs. Remember, signs are for the Jews. And for the last 2,000 years, they haven't been looking up, have they? So Jesus does answer their prayer. He just made them wait a little bit. <laughs> okay. But it's interesting. The Pharisees also and the Sadducees came and tempting, desired him that he would show them a sign from heaven. Okay. Well, Jesus didn't want to do that. He didn't want them to command him. He was the king. He's supposed to be commanding them. Right. So he answered and said unto them, when it is even, you say it will be fair weather for the sky is red. And in the morning it will be foul weather today, for the sky is red. <laughs> and lowering. O oh, ye hypocrites, you can discern the face of the sky, but can you not discern the sign of the times? So it's, it's interesting. They're asking for a sign from heaven. Well, are they talking about the stars up there? That, that kind of sign? Or like the planets? And Jesus is saying, well, when you look at heaven, all you see is the weather. You only see, you know, the atmosphere. You're not looking where I am way up there. So that might be part of it. But 
Jesus calls them hypocrites. Now, this is an interesting thing because it says, when it is even, you say, we fair weather for the sky is red. And then, <laughs> when the sky is red, you say this over here. <laughs> so, <laughs> look at the sky. And they say one day, they say one thing, another thing. And it's the same. So, he's literally calling them out saying, you're the worst weather people that ever... <laughs> You ever watch the Weather Channel and it's never exactly what they said? Um, yeah, that happens a lot. So my dad was a weatherman for many years and he did the weather in Panama City on channel, I don't know if it was seven or nine, for many years. And uh, people hate weathermen because they're always wrong, you know. So Jesus calls them hypocrites. He says, look, you can't even discern the weather. How could you discern a sign from heaven if I did give you one? Basically is what he's saying. You wouldn't even get that right. That's how messed up you are. And then Jesus goes off on these people. And we're going to read that. But man, wow, he goes off on these people. There's a saying, though, that's kind of interesting. If you're a sailor, I'm talking about a red sky here. Have you ever heard this? I don't know if anybody was in the Navy. But there's a saying that says, red sky in the morning, sailors take warning. Red sky at night, sailors delight. And there's something to that about the atmospheric and the clouds and everything. But if it's a real red sky in the morning, there's probably a storm coming. But if it's a red sky at night, you know it's probably going to be very calm. and You don't have to worry about a storm. So there is something to that. And uh, that's something I learned and I think is kind of neat. So, next thing we read here is verse 4. Jesus says, well in verse 3 he says, But can you not discern the signs of the times? So instead of looking up in heaven for signs, you should have been in your, your Bible reading the book of Daniel because the sign of the times is so many years are determined upon the O Israel. And if they'd read that, they would have said, oh, well, he showed up right when it said the Messiah is supposed to show up. So that's interesting. But then Jesus hammers them and says, a wicked and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign. And there shall no sign be given unto it, but the sign of the prophet Jonas, which is Jonah, and he left them and departed. <laughs> Can you see that? They're coming to Jesus. Oh, just show us a sign. You hypocrites! The only sign you've got is Jonah. And he turns around and just walks away. And they're going, looking up for a sign, looking down. They're scratching their head. They're going, what did he just say? He said something about the sign of the times. I don't know. What's that mean? I mean, can you see them? They have no idea what he's talking about. Because they're fleshly and he's spiritual. And they're thinking of this fleshy world, and Jesus is thinking of the spiritual world. He's making a spiritual application of a prophet way back when that they should have read. So what was the sign of the prophet Jonah? Do you remember the sign of the prophet Jonah? Um, before we look at the sign of the prophet Jonah, John chapter 4 and verse 48. John chapter 4 and verse 48. I want to give you as much scripture as I can. And remember 1 Corinthians 1.22, the Jews seek after a sign. Well, John chapter 4 and verse 48, Jesus says this. John 4, 48, Then said Jesus unto him, Except ye see signs and wonders, you will not believe. So the Jews have to have a sign in order to believe. They saw wonders. They saw the miracles he did. But they didn't believe. They wanted to see the sign too. So it wasn't enough for them to see him healing people, healing the blind, healing the deaf. They wanted to see a sign also. That shows an unbelieving heart. They couldn't believe what they saw there. They wanted to see more. So... What is the sign of Jonah? Well, let's go to Jonah chapter 1 and verse 17. The book of Jonah is an amazing book, and it's all about a prophet named Jonah who was told to go to Gentiles. And he did not like that. He didn't want to go to Gentiles. He was a Jew. And a lot of times the Jews didn't want to have anything to do with, um, with the Gentiles. So Jonah, which comes after the book of Obadiah, <laughs> after the book of Amos, if that helps you, um, Jonah chapter 1 and verse 17. Now the Lord had prepared a great fish to swallow up Jonah. And Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. Okay? So you know the story of Jonah. There was this huge whale. And uh, I'm not good at drawing whales, so let's just draw it like that. This huge whale. And he got inside that whale for how long? Three days and three nights. Now what does that remind us of? Well, let's go to Matthew chapter 12 and verse 40. That reminds us of Jesus. Matthew chapter 12 and verse 40. And in Matthew 12, 40, For as Jonas was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. So Jesus is literally telling them about His death, burial, and resurrection, but kind of in a way where they don't understand. 
But as Jesus was three days, three nights, and rose, now he rose on the third day. How could he rose on the third day and it still be three days and three nights? He rose at the very end of the third day. So that makes sense. So he rose, well, I guess the beginning of the next day. And we rose on a Sunday, but it was three days and three nights. So that's the sign. And Jesus is telling them, you want to see a sign, here's the sign to look for. Now, do you think they understood what he said? If they remembered this later after that happened, they would have gone, oh, okay, now I believe. <laughs> but they probably forgot. But it's given twice. It's given in Matthew chapter 12 and it's given in Matthew chapter 16. And as we continue here, we'll see it again where Jesus says, I'm going to die and be buried, but then rise again and be in the earth three days and three nights. So back to uh, Matthew chapter 16. But look what he says, a wicked and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign. That reminds me of that thing in the book of John, remember, when they come to him and they accuse a woman of adultery and they have stones in their hands. And he says, well, he without sin, throw the first stone. And they all walked away. So these Sadducees and Pharisees are typical politicians. They've got their mistresses, probably, and they're committing adultery, aren't they? Uh, sad. So Jesus, and rather than deal with them and say, oh, sure, let me show you a sign. He said, you bunch of hypocrites, you're wicked and you're a bunch of adulterers. So he's name calling. No, he's not name calling, is he? He's telling them what they are because it's the truth that he's preaching to them. Nobody likes a preacher. John the Baptist got his head cut off for saying that. And here Jesus says it. There shall no sign be given unto it, but the sign of the prophet Jonas. And he left them and departed. Now, we're going to see something very interesting here as we continue. Just remember Jonah. Because a little bit later, Jesus talks about Peter and says, Peter, Simon Barjona. You know what Bar means? Son. Son of Jonah. What an odd thing that Peter's dad's name was Jonah. Isn't that interesting? So we got Jonah mentioned twice in this chapter. So I find that amazing. I find that interesting. Um, and there's a lot more we could get into, but some people say, well, no, it was a fish. It wasn't a whale. Have you ever heard of, I've heard Southern Baptist preachers say that. I don't know what they're reading, but they're not reading the Bible. It wasn't a whale. It was a fish and a whale's not a fish. But yet there's a fish called a whale shark. <laughs> so the Bible's always true. All you have to do is look and you'll see the answer. So yes, it was a whale and yes, it was a fish and yes, it can be both. Okay. So it might've been a whale shark. So as we continue, Look at verse uh, 4 again in Matthew 16. A wicked and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign, and there shall no sign be given unto it but the sign of the prophet Jonas, and he left them and departed. So Jesus walks away. Now, there was also a sign during the time of Jonah as well. Another sign in heaven. And I've read historical records that when Jonah went to preach to the people in Nineveh, there was an eclipse. And that eclipse scared the people. And I guess maybe that's why they repented. Because we know they repented. So I don't remember where I read that, but you can look that up. And there was, so it's, there's so much going on here. Jesus is saying the sign of Jonah, which was this. But at the same time, if they knew their history, went, oh, there was a sign in heaven over there too. And what was it supposed to mark? The destruction of the city if they didn't repent. So do you see there's all these little things that Jesus is saying that's kind of hidden there. And if you look into it, when Jesus speaks, it's loaded. He's not just saying one thing. He's saying three or four things. And you can see that the more you read the Bible. That's why it says study to show thyself approved. There's so much you can get in the Bible if you keep reading it. It's not like a novel. You read it one time and you throw it away. The more you read the Bible, the more you get each time. Amen. So I find that amazing. I find that amazing. So maybe there'll be a clips that marks when Jesus comes. I don't know. We'll see in the future. And when his disciples were come to the other side, they had forgotten to take bread. Here we go again. We already saw twice when they forgot bread. They're pretty forgetful, aren't they? <laughs> Why are they forgetting? Well, Jesus said, I'm the bread of life. So maybe they're just saying, well, he is the bread. And maybe they're thinking, well, he's always taken care of us before. But he gave them one job and they can't even do that right. All right. So if they're a type of a preacher, what's a preacher supposed to have? The bread. This is the spiritual food. So when a guy gets up in the pulpit, he should teach you something. Uh, some pulpits you go to. Instead of bread, they just give you a little bit of flour and you choke on it. You know, this is, they never, it's hard to go to church and just sit there and listen and just get a, a milk sop message. Um, I have a friend who's blind and he's an evangelist. And we've talked before about how bad churches have gotten. And we sit and listen to messages. And many churches, you don't get fed. The preachers don't know their Bible. 
And he said, well, I don't know if I said that or he said this, but I said, going to many churches nowadays is like going to a steakhouse. And you go to the steakhouse and they say, I'm sorry, we're out of steak. All we have is buttermilk. And you go, buttermilk? I don't want any buttermilk, but I'm so hungry. Well, maybe give me a glass. Oh, by the way, it's not cold. And you're like, warm buttermilk? No, I'm good. You know, (laughs) I think I'll go home and cook myself a steak. Do you know you can learn more reading the Bible than going to churches nowadays? Now, I'm not saying don't go to church. Find a good church where they actually teach the Bible. But uh, we were talking about how we have to feed ourselves. You need to read your Bible daily. It's called daily bread. If you're not reading the Bible every day and all you're doing is coming to church on Sunday just to get the Bible, you're not going to grow very much as a Christian, are you? You need to feed yourself daily. What if you ate once a week? You'd be really fit, wouldn't you? Or would you be physically anemic? Well, a lot of people are spiritually anemic because they only eat once a, a week. I hope you read your Bible the rest of the week. Because you need to feed yourself. It's like bread. Boy, I got off on that, didn't I? So, and when the disciples were come to the other side, they had forgotten to take bread. Then Jesus said to them, Take heed and beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and of the Sadducees. Now, Jesus is talking about bread and he mentions a word, leaven. What is leaven? Well, leaven is like yeast. What do you use to make bread? Yeast. Now, there's kind of two different kinds of bread. In the Old Testament, God said unleavened bread. He told them not to put yeast, but to make bread without yeast. That's called hardtack. Have you ever had hardtack? Or as the dentist, I think I broke my tooth, you know, because hardtack is hard bread. But we use yeast in our bread so that it, it does what? It gets bigger. And then we want all those little air pockets in it because, oh, it's easier to eat. And if we dip it, why? Well, all that stuff goes in the little holes. And we, I like yeast and bread. So Jesus goes off on them and he says, hey, those Pharisees, they have leaven and they aren't right. And so the leaven is a type of false doctrine. And so Jesus has given them another spiritual lesson. Jesus is always doing this. They come to him with this physical problem and he turns it into a spiritual lesson. You think they would have learned by now. So the leaven of the Pharisees. So what do you do with leaven or yeast? Okay, you get all the flour, you get the water, you start kneading it together, you put the yeast in and you leave it. What happens? It starts growing and growing and growing and growing. What happens if you start jumping? I did that before and my mom got mad because she's cooking bread and I'm jumping around the house and the bread went just like that. And it wasn't very good when it came out of the oven. So false doctrine, it might look like you're growing, but it will fall very quick. So if you go out and you start a church on false doctrine, is that church growing in the Lord or is that church swelling and is about to fall? When we start a church, we want to start it on true doctrine. It's like this old preacher said one time. He was driving down the interstate to go to a meeting to preach and he saw a dead dog on the side of the road. Somebody hit that dog when they were driving and he said, oh, that was a pretty dog. That's a shame. He preached a meeting for about three days Drove back by, and as he's coming back by, he saw that same dog on the side of the road. And do you know that dog was bigger than it was when he saw it before? Now, was that dog growing because it was a healthy dog? Or was that dog swelling because of all the corruption and all the worms and all the parasites? You know that dog's about to go pop. And what's inside there? It's full of yucky, nasty, stinky stuff. So a lot of the churches you see in America that look so big, what do they call? They call them mega churches. They're not founded on truth. They're founded on this. Are they growing or are they swelling? They're swelling and they're about to pop with their false doctrine. So be careful. Go to a church that's King James only, the right Bible. Go to a church that's preaching the right doctrine. Otherwise, you might be corrupt and smelly. Remember God says you make me want to puke? <laughs> yeah, yeah, so be careful. All right, so enough about the bread lesson. But um, Jesus says in verse 6, Then Jesus said to them, Take heed and beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and of the Sadducees. And they reasoned among themselves, saying, Is it because we have taken no bread? They're like, What is he talking about? The leaven of the Pharisees? Is it because we don't have any bread? Which when Jesus perceived, he said unto them, O ye of little faith, why reason ye among yourselves, because ye have brought no bread? Do ye not yet understand, neither remember the five loaves of the five thousand, and how many baskets ye took up? Neither the seven loaves of the four thousand, and how many baskets ye took up? 
How is it that ye do not understand that I spake it not to you concerning bread, that ye should beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and of the Sadducees? Then understood they how that he bade them not beware of the leaven of bread, but of the doctrine of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. So we have false doctrine. So the Pharisees and the Sadducees, here's the true people of Israel, the true followers. Here's the false. So this is people that were following false doctrine. And they were within the camp. They were within Israel. Today, we see the same thing. Here's the church age, and we see a false church that claims the name of Jesus, but yet they're not the true branch of Christianity, and they have false doctrine. And it's sad, but we see that all over. And we see a lot of people in false doctrine, and they claim to be of God. So just as there was apostasy in the time of Jesus, there's apostasy today. So that's sad, isn't it? But we have to watch out for false doctrine. Now there's a whole lot more we can get into. Let's quickly look at the reference in Luke chapter 12, because I always like to give you the cross reference. Sometimes we get a little bit more information. So Luke chapter 12, verse 1 through 3. Luke chapter 12, verse 1 through 3. And it says, In the meantime, when there were gathered together an innumerable multitude of people, insomuch that they trod one upon another, he began to say unto his disciples, First of all, beware ye of the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. Okay, so there's a lot of people there. Did Jesus feed them again? Was that like the third feeding? It's not, it doesn't tell us. But I don't know. But it says, For there is nothing covered that shall not be revealed, neither hid that shall not be known. Therefore, whatsoever ye have spoken in darkness shall be heard in the light, and that which ye have spoken in the ear in closets shall be proclaimed upon the housetops. What does that sound like? That sounds like someday you'll give account to God. So the Sadducees said, well, we don't believe that we, give, we have an afterlife. But Jesus is saying, yeah, one day you will. After you die, resurrect and stand before God at the judgment and give account. Just like Jesus said, every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give account thereof in the day of judgment. So do you see how we get just one guy's view of it in Matthew? But when we look at the other guy, we see the whole picture. So did Jesus say that while the Sadducees were still there and they overheard that? Did he rebuke the Sadducees? And they're like, ooh, maybe there is a laughter life. I hadn't thought of that. You know? So I don't know, but it's neat to get the full picture by looking at all of them. All right, so false doctrine. Now, Paul says this in Galatians chapter 5. So go to Galatians chapter 5, and uh, this theme of leaven being false doctrine is continued in Paul's ministry. And so in Galatians chapter 5 and verse 9, Paul says this, Galatians 5, 9, A little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. So make sure that our whole lump of doctrine has not any yeast in it. Because just a little yeast can contaminate the whole thing. Just a little bit of false doctrine can mess up the whole thing. Let's don't get any false doctrine. Let's keep this thing without it. Now, let's go to uh, Mark chapter 8 and read here. In Mark chapter 8, another cross-reference, and maybe we'll get a little bit more information. Mark chapter 8 and verse 14. Here we have a little bit more information. Mark 8, 14 through 21. Now the disciples have forgotten to take bread, neither had they in the ship with them more than one loaf. Okay, so they forgot to take a lot of bread. They did have maybe a loaf, but they didn't bring enough for everyone. And he charged them, saying, Take heed, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and of the leaven of Herod. Oh, wow. Here's some extra, <laughs> extra information. Beware of the, how would you say it? Beware of the so-called spiritual leaders who have false doctrine, but also be weary of the physical leader whose doctrine is against what? Well, today we'd say the Constitution. We have a Constitution. It's God's given rights to us, the Bill of Rights. And you know what we're seeing? We're seeing those in power saying, no, we need to go against the Constitution. There's a word for that. It's called treason. And those people shouldn't be allowed to do that. Hopefully the American people will stand up and say, no, no, that's not what we want. But isn't that interesting how they're going against God and the Bible and the very law of the land? It's called hypocrisy. Hmm, interesting. In verse 16, And they reason among themselves, saying, It is because we have no bread. And when Jesus knew it, he saith unto them, Why reason ye? Because ye have no bread. Perceive ye not yet, neither understand. Have ye your heart yet hardened? 
what a thing to ask the disciples. Is your heart hardened? Is he saying that because that's the heart condition of the Pharisees and the Sadducees? Sounds like it. Having eyes, see ye not, and having ears, hear ye not, and do ye not remember? When I break the five loaves among five thousand, how many baskets full of fragments took ye up? They say unto him, Twelve. And when the seven among four thousand, how many baskets full of fragments took ye up? And they said, Seven. And he said unto them, And he said unto them, How is it that ye do not understand? So, interesting, we get a little more information when we check all the cross-references. I like that. I like doing that. I think it's fun. So, watch out for false doctrine. Now, Paul tells us to follow sound doctrine. Let's go to a couple verses of Paul. 1 Timothy chapter 4. In order to have sound doctrine, sometimes you have to separate yourself. And this is what we see Jesus doing. He turned away and walked away from those with false doctrine. There might be a time in your life when you meet somebody and you like them and they claim to be a Christian, but they have false doctrine. You might have to turn around and walk away. I've had to do that before and it hurts. But when someone starts down that road of false doctrine, it grows more and more and more. Just like yeast will make that leaven. So the best thing to do is cut it off. Get away from it. So Paul tells us, no, follow true doctrine. 1 Timothy 4.3. Uh, let's see. 4.3. Okay. Maybe it's 2 Timothy here. Might have wrote that down wrong. Yes, okay, sorry. 2 Timothy 4 3. And it says, For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lusts shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. What an interesting thing. It's because of lust they get into false doctrine. Isn't that what Jesus said about them? They were adulterers. Now, lust isn't always a lust of the flesh for the opposite sex or something like that, it can be a lust for something else like lusting after money or fame or something like that. So when you get your eyes on fleshly things and you want that more than God, you're going to get some false doctrine come in because that's hardening and changing your heart. And there's a lot more verses, um, verse 16 and 17, I believe. Uh, nope, that's not what I wanted. So, okay, let's go to 2 Timothy 3.16. 2 Timothy 3.16. And it says, All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. And then 2 Timothy 4, 2 and 3. Well, we read verse 3. Verse 4, And they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned into fables. So, doctrine matters. Amen? And it's more than just doctrine matters. It's true doctrine matters. You see, even the bad people have their doctrines. I can't tell you how many times people contact me because when somebody gets saved on the Internet, I always tell them to find a good church to go to. And uh, they say independentbaptist.church is the website to go to look for good King James Bible believing churches. And uh, sometimes people will go and then they'll, they'll say, Brother Brick, I, I'm not hearing what you preach. I'm hearing different stuff. And uh, they'll say, check out the website. And then here's where it says doctrinal statement. And you read the doctrinal statements of some churches, and they'll give you just enough to make you think that they're a good church. But then when you go there, it's way different. So I like a doctrinal statement that's just a lot. <laughs> I like it long. and have a lot. I don't like just a brief little to make them look like they're who they say they are. So be careful. Sometimes you have to go to a church and sit there and listen for a long time. A guy called me the other day, and he said he went to a church. And uh, he went up to the pastor, and he says, hey, What's the gospel? Where in the Bible does it say this is the gospel? And the pastor said, John 3, 16. He said, sir, I don't want to argue, but that's not the gospel. Can I show you? And the guy got mad. He goes, no, get out of here. He goes, all I want to do is show you the gospel in the Bible. No, get out. He got all upset. That was supposed to be a King James Bible believing church. And that's how the pastor was toward him. Now, you and I know what he wanted to do. He wanted to take him to 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4 and say, hey, have you ever seen this before? This is where it's... But I don't know if he came across to that guy that he's wanting to argue. I don't, but I just thought, man, that's, that's awful. Now, John 3.16 is a great verse, but that's not the gospel in and of itself, right? So it's interesting how some pastors are very easily offended. Isn't that something? Could they maybe be one of these? <laughs> the Pharisees? I don't know. I bet you there's a lot of Pharisees out there. Could they be Sadducees? Uh, maybe. Maybe that's the problem, is we have a lot of these people in the pulpit with their false doctrines. Okay, back to Matthew chapter 16. Boy, I could go into that for a long time, but I'll stop there. But just remember that doctrine matters. But not just doctrine matters, true doctrine matters. Even 
False churches have their doctrine, but we want the true doctrine. Okay, so starting there in verse 13, when Jesus came unto the coast of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? So Jesus asked them, Who am I? Now remember, I don't know if you remember, but we've talked about the difference between the who and the what. In Jesus' earthly ministry, it was all about who he is. And they had to believe he was the Messiah. When the Jews rejected their Messiah, Jesus told Paul, here's what I want you to do. Go tell them more about what I did. Tell them about justification and how you can be justified through the blood. Tell them what I did. So the message today, the gospel is what Jesus did for us. And we trust in what he did. We're saved. It's not enough to just believe that Jesus is the Messiah. That's the message more to the Jews. But, you know, you go to some churches and they claim to be King James Bible believers and they say, yeah, just believe in Jesus. What does that even mean? I mean, well, if you read the Bible, believing in Jesus is you believe he's the Messiah. But where is trust the blood of Jesus? They leave that message out. And that's what's so sad. That's what's so sad. So they're not getting the message of what. They're just still sticking here with the. They're in the wrong dispensation, <laughs> if you will. That's kind of sad. And yet many of them don't believe in dispensations. How sad is that? So here we go. Are you ready for this? Now this totally obliterates the Roman Catholic Church. What we're about to read is what they call the foundation of the Roman Catholic Church. And Roman Catholicism believes that this proves that they are the true church with the true doctrine. I can't wait to read this because I'm not a Roman Catholic because I noticed that they don't line up with the Bible. And if it doesn't line up with the Bible, I'm not going there. I'm not going with that. So let's look at this. And it says here, Jesus says, Who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And they said, Some say thou art John the Baptist, some Elias, and others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. So the people of Israel are, are sitting around talking, saying, we've seen signs from this guy. We've seen miracles. Uh, who do you think he is? And one guy goes, well, I think it's John the Baptist, risen from the dead. Well, wouldn't that be nice? <laughs> but that's not who it was. That, that would be a miracle right there. Um, others go, well, I think it's Elijah. Okay, Elias is Elijah. Now, why would they think it was Elijah? The last book in the Old Testament, Malachi, says that Elijah must return. And also, Moses is going to return. Look over there in chapter 17 and look at verse 3. Who are the two people that appear right there? Mm -hmm. Moses and Elijah. I can't wait to talk about that next week, the two witnesses that show up in the book of Revelation. But some people say, well, I think he's John the Baptist. Some say, I think he's Elijah. Others say, I think he's Jeremiah the prophet. Now, why they say that, I don't know. I don't see anywhere in the Bible where it says Jeremiah is going to come back. So I, maybe they're just making things up. I don't know. And then some of them said, well, he's just one of the prophets. Now, why didn't they say he's the promised Messiah in the book of Daniel? Why didn't they say that? Were they even reading the book of Daniel? You know what I mean? They, they probably should have been. But he saith unto them, but whom say ye that I am? And there's the I am. Jesus is the I am. And Simon Peter, now Simon Peter has three names, Simon, Peter, and Cephas. This is going to be important here in a minute. Cephas is also his name. And Simon Peter answered and said, now this is so important, we call this Peter's confession. Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Now, he stands up and says the right thing, probably the first time in his life. <laughs> Yay, he said the right thing. Oh, good. Now, this is amazing what happens next. Verse 17, And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Bar-Jonah, son of Jonah. Remember, there's Jonah again. I find that interesting. For flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. So he said, hey, the Father must have shown you that. And it's something that he just outright says, but, but I, I just believe that you're the Christ. What does that mean? Christ means the anointed one, which is the Messiah, the Mashiach, which means anointed one. So he's saying, I believe that you are the one prophesied in the book of Daniel that you are coming. And then he says, the son of the living God. Now, he's just not saying, I believe you're a son of God. He's saying, I believe that you are God manifest in the flesh. I think that's tied into that. Now, verse 18, And I say also unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. All right, now, there's several ways to look at this. The first way to look at it is, And I say unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock. The this rock would be what he just said, that thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. So Jesus is building the church on the fact that he is the Christ. Okay, that's one way to look at it. 
The other way to look at it is, and I say also unto thee, thou art Peter, that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church. The Catholic Church looks at that and says, Jesus says, you're Peter, and upon you I build my church. So when you go, she's shaking her head. She knows what the Catholic. So the Catholics believe that Peter is the first pope. So they make Peter the first pope. And they say that upon him is that church built. Now, how do we know that's not true? Well, if Peter is the first pope. <laughs> sorry. Look at what the first pope does in verse 23. Jesus says to Peter, because Peter rebukes Jesus in verse 22. So the first pope tells Jesus he's wrong. <laughs> That's a bad pope. And then verse 23, but he turned and said unto Peter, get thee behind me, Satan, for thou art an offensive. So the first pope is full of Satan. Is that what it's saying there? <laughs> you see the mess you get in when you don't rightly divide? How do we rightly divide this? Well, the third application, go back to verse 18. And I say also unto thee, Thou art Peter. All right. Look at here's Peter right there. Here's Jesus. And Jesus says, thou art Peter. Right. I'm pointing at Peter. But he says, and upon this rock. Is Jesus saying upon you, this rock? Is he calling? If you say this, that means that you're pointing. So Jesus is saying, you're Peter, but upon this rock, me, Jesus, I will build my church. So that's what he's saying. He's not saying I'm building the church on... Uh, on Peter, he's saying, I'm building the church on me. Now, when you go to other um, languages, this is why the Catholic Church loves to go to other languages. All right, in English, Jesus and Peter, it's not the same. So you cannot try to say that Peter is the rock. It doesn't work. The word in English for rock is rock. It's not Jesus, it's not Peter, okay? In Greek, the word Jesus is Jesus, okay? The word for Peter is Petra. In the Greek language, the word for rock is Petros. They're different. Now, the Catholics want to go back to the Greek and try to say, well, but it's not the same word. It's a different word. You go to Latin. The word for Jesus is Jesus. The word for Peter is Petrus. In Latin, the word for rock is Petram. It's not Petrus. They're two different words. But the Catholic Church wants so bad to make that rock Peter that they go to Aramaic. Now the word for Jesus in Aramaic is Yeshua, right? But in Aramaic, you have something very strange. The way you say Peter in Aramaic is Cephas. Remember Cephas? The word for Peter is Cephas. The word in Aramaic, Cephas, is Cephas. That's Nafish, that's the letters. So Cephas is the word for Peter, but you say Cephas it also means rock in that language. So the Roman Catholic Church loves to go to the Aramaic language. And they say, no, that's the oldest language. So it's really saying that Peter is the rock in the original languages. You see how they do that? So they build themselves a church on what? False doctrine. Is the foundation Peter or is the foundation Jesus? Jesus. Here's the foundation right here. And it's called a rock. Now, is it Peter? Or is it Jesus? Jesus? I believe that it's Jesus. Let me show you why. Scripture with Scripture. Let's go to this verse right here, 1 Corinthians chapter 10. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. So, what if the largest church in the world has the wrong foundation? Do we follow it? I guess we have to preach against it. That's why I'm not a Roman Catholic. 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 4, look what it says. And did all drink the same spiritual drink, for they drank of that spiritual rock, that's a capital R, that followed them, and that rock was... Christ. It doesn't say Peter? <laughs> oh, it does say, it says Christ, doesn't it? So, who is Jesus? Jesus is the foundation. Amen. And so, if you have a church that runs around and says the foundation is Peter, you have a false church. And that's what that church is. So let's go back to Matthew chapter 16 and let's read that again with that understanding. And it says, And Simon Peter answered and said, verse 16, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. And I say also unto thee that thou art Peter, 
But then he says, and upon this rock, he's talking about himself, Jesus, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. So Jesus is the rock. Jesus is saying this rock because he's the rock. And he's saying, I'm building my church on me, not on you, Peter. Because if Peter were the first pope, we have a problem. He's correcting Jesus within one verse after that. <laughs> or a couple of verses after that. A couple of verses after that, he rebukes Jesus. So does the pope have the right to rebuke Jesus? Well, in the Catholic Church, they say the pope can speak and whatever he says is true. Well, if Jesus says one thing, the Pope says another, that church says, no, you follow the Pope. Have you ever been to the Catholic Church? They follow tradition. And they claim to follow the Bible, but they follow tradition. And often they'll follow tradition rather than the Bible. So if Peter is the first Pope, we have quite a problem. Because the Bible says the foundation is Jesus. That's in 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 11. 1 Corinthians 3, 11. Let me read it to you quickly here. And it says... For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ, not Peter, not Cephas. Okay, now, they claim that Peter is the first pope. All right, can a pope get married? They say popes can't get married. Well, uh, let's go to uh, Matthew 8 and verse 14. Peter makes the worst pope that ever lived <laughs> because he's married. He corrects Jesus, and then Jesus says, Get thee behind me, Satan. <laughs> That's kind of a warning about popes, isn't it? Matthew chapter 8, and verse 14. And when Jesus was coming to Peter's house, he saw his wife's mother laid and sick of a fever. So if Peter was the first pope, guess what? He was married. That's right. How come all the other popes aren't married? Do we need to go to 1 Timothy and, and, and Titus and how it says a bishop is to be the husband of one wife? You can be married if you're a pastor or a bishop or anything like that. So the Catholic Church has a lot of bad doctrine. And there's a lot more I could get into. Um, the Pope says, come and kiss my finger, or kiss my ring, or kiss my feet. Well, in the book of Acts, up shows Cornelius. Guess what he is? An Italian. <laughs> and he shows up and starts to worship. He says, get, get thee up. Don't worship me. I'm just a man like you. What's the Pope want? Worship. So popes are not biblical according to the Bible. There's no pope in the Bible. That word does not show up. Guess what they're called? Popes are called pontiffs. Where does that word come from? Pontifus, or let's see, Pontifus Maximus. Have you ever heard of that? That comes from Rome. And the pontiff was the priest in their false religion. So when you look at Catholicism, it comes from a mixing of pagan Rome with Christianity in about 325 AD at the Council of Nicaea when Constantine said we're going to become Christian. And they kept all those old pagan words. And so the popes are Pontifixes Maximuses. Pontifex Maximi. I don't even know how to make that plural. I don't. But the popes, they're using the title of a pagan religion. And they're using a word that's not in the Bible. And they're claiming that they are that, and yet you read your Bible, you're like, no, nah, I don't. I, how can I follow that if I'm going to read my Bible and believe my Bible? So back to Matthew chapter 17, here's where it gets even worse. Now, this is a very troubling passage. I can't claim to tell you what it means exactly. All I can do is show you what it says, but I know what it doesn't mean, what they say. Because they claim that this gives the Pope the right to forgive the sins of people. How does one man forgive the sins of another man? if both of those men are sinners. The only way we can have our sins forgiven is through Jesus Christ who shed His blood for us. Amen. All right. So we come to Jesus and we trust His blood for salvation. Now you go to the Catholic Church, you know what they say? Blood, 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 blood. They talk about blood, but in that religion, what is it? I'm running out of room up here. Here's a cup. And uh, guess what? What's in that cup? Wine. Wine? And yet they say that's blood. And if you'll go to the mass and you'll, they don't even let you drink it anymore before you had to drink it. They'll tell you, and that will give you forgiveness. So alcohol gets you saved? <laughs> that's weird. So do you see how that whole thing is perverted? By the way, that comes from Babylon. That's part of the Babylon religion is offering up cakes, you know. And, and, and. so I'm not a Roman Catholic. I see it as very 
corrupt and full of what? Leaven. And them trying to make Peter the first. But by the way, oh, do we, we better look it up. We better look it up. Nowhere in the Bible. Go to first Peter. Nowhere in the Bible does it say that Peter ever went to Rome. And yet they try to make him the first pope in Rome. You don't have that in the Bible. It's never shown. The only guy going to Rome in the Bible is Luke and Paul. But in the Bible itself, look at where Peter is in 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 13. Peter is not in Rome. I'm sorry, he's not the first pope sitting in Rome. Peter says in 1 Peter 5, 13, The church that is at Babylon elected together with you, saluteth you, and so doth Marcus my son. Peter is in Babylon toward the end of not in Rome. So how on earth do you try to force him to the church starting with that guy in a place where he never even visited, as far as we know? At least the Bible doesn't say. So that church is really messed up. Okay? Now we're going to go to Matthew chapter 16. And now we're going to talk about, I'm running out of room here, so we're going to talk about this. What is this? Keys. Right? Okay. Let's read the rest of this. Now, the Catholic Church has started off on the wrong foundation. They're trying to say it's Peter instead of Jesus. And they take what's written next to Peter, and they claim that you can only find salvation in that church. How many of you heard that? There's no salvation outside of the Roman Catholic Church. Is that true? No. It's not what my Bible says. It says salvation is through Christ and His blood atonement. So, here it says in verse, well, let me back up to verse 18. And I say also unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock, Jesus is talking about himself, he's the rock, I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Now that's a wonderful promise right there that, that the gates of hell will never prevail against his church. The true church will always exist. And uh, wouldn't it be funny if there was somebody in this world named Gates, and he was trying to do something to put people in hell or something? What? Hmm. Anyway, well, we know whatever he wants wouldn't, wouldn't prosper, would it? But anyway, it says in verse 19, And I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. So what is this? Well, he talks about keys. Well, there's got to be at least two. If you go to the Vatican in Rome and look at the Pope, the Pope has everywhere two keys on all of his symbols and everything. And he claims to have the two keys. The two keys to what? <laughs> well, in his mind, I have the key to heaven and the key to hell. And if you have to come to me to find one or the other. That's what he's thinking. But is that what Jesus is saying? Well, Jesus says this to Peter, but he's also talking to the other apostles there. And while I've given of the keys of the kingdom of heaven, but whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. So what is this binding and loosing? I've never gotten a, a perfect answer on that. I've never understood that completely. And guess what? It's found in chapter 18 as well. And we're going to look at that when we get to chapter 18, so I won't go there right now. But it's in chapter 18, verse 18 through 20. So what does that mean? Well, knowing what we know, how the Jews rejected, and now we're over here under Paul's ministry, and God's going more to Gentiles. Um, first of all, I think the keys were doors. When I, when I think of a key, it opens a door. So would there be two doors that needed to be open? Well, first of all, there was an open door here, for them to preach to the Jews to accept their Messiah. And guess what? They stoned Stephen, slammed the door shut. So that was one key. Well, then God calls Paul, and Paul says, now you're going more to the Gentiles. There's your open door. That would be the second key. So the, to me, that's the two keys to the Jews and to the Gentiles. That's how I see it. That makes sense to me. And Paul talks a lot about an open door was set before me. So he goes through it. But what is the binding and the loosing? I don't know. All I know is that if I preach the gospel and you get saved, then you're going up there. If you choose not to, then you're going down there. And so to me, it's through preaching of the gospel that something happens up there or down here. So that's the only thing I got on that. But here's what the Catholic Church says. No, that means the Pope has the absolute authority to decide who goes to heaven and who doesn't. Okay, so a man, a sinner... Right? Can do that. Well, here's what the Pope needs to do. And if he's listening, you need to do this. You need to get you out a piece of paper and make a papal bull. <laughs> That's what it's called. Whenever he writes something, it's a decree. It's called a bull. <laughs> Isn't that hilarious? In Latin and in Spanish, it's a bula. But in English, it's called a bull. 
Now, when somebody's lying, what do we say? <laughs> bull! That's just hilarious, a papal bull. He needs to write a papal bull, and he needs to write, Everyone that has ever lived on the face of the earth is now forgiven of all their sins. Why doesn't he do that? If he really loves God, and he loves people, and he really has that power, why doesn't he do that? He would be the most famous man on earth, and everyone would love him and want to kiss his feet. But there's a reason why he doesn't do that. You know what that reason is? How would that church continue? Everyone in the world will say, well, thank you, and go sit in, and no one would ever go to church. <laughs> and now they're not getting an offering, are they? So you see what that is? Roman Catholicism is a religion of money. You go to that church. Now, I, the last time I went to a Catholic church was about four years ago when I went to my cousin's funeral. And we thought it was going to be in the funeral home across the street. I had no idea my cousin was a Roman Catholic. And we were there, and the funeral home goes, no, it's across the street. So we walk across the street, walk in the door, and I went, we're in a Catholic church, aren't we? <laughs> I didn't realize. And it's too late now. We couldn't walk out. They're like, oh, come here. You know, all the family. It's like, okay, we're here. And uh, so we're there. And uh, we're inside this Catholic church, and I look over, and in the Catholic church, you light a candle, right? For, and that's your prayer candle or something like that. And it said, little candle, 50 cents, big candle, a dollar. <laughs> Literally. You have to pay to light a candle. Man, I'm glad I didn't eat a lot of beans. You know, I would have had to lit a candle. But anyway, that's a bad joke. Anyway, so uh, they charge you for the candles. Now, they charge you for everything else. You want to do the baptism of your child? Got to pay. How about the mass? There's an old saying, um, low mass, low money. High mass, high price, high money. Because you pay for the mass. And they tell you, you have to pay for a mass to get your loved one out of hell. So that religion is all about that right there. If it was a true religion of God, that Pope, Peter would have written down, everyone is forgiven of every sin. And boom, everyone's going to heaven. But he didn't do that. The next guy could have, or the next guy. or the, How come none of the 2,000 years, none of them had that idea? Whoa, I got this power. Well, I'm just going to go ahead and forgive everybody. How come they never did that? Because they know they don't have that power. They know they're twisting the scriptures. So that's not saying that you have the right to forgive and not forgive. There's something more to it. And I don't know what it is exactly. I tell you, I don't understand that verse. And I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Okay. And whatsoever thou shalt bind on the earth shall be bound in heaven. And whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. The only thing that makes sense to me is you tell someone the gospel, they get saved. That's binding, isn't it? Like Joseph taught the contract, right? Now you're saved. That's eternal security right there. Now you're going to heaven. But you go to someone and offer them salvation, teach them how, and they say, I don't want that. Well, then they're loosed. When they die, where do they go? So that's the only way I know how to make sense of this. But I do not follow the Catholic religion. I cannot accept that he's the first pope. I cannot accept. I accept Jesus as the rock. And only through his blood are we forgiven of sins, not through the blood in the cup, because that's not even blood. Okay. Amen. So do you see why we're not ecumenical? We can't join up with the Roman Catholic religion. No. To do that, we have to worship him instead of Jesus and claim that he's our foundation instead of Jesus. And we have to throw away all that the Bible teaches and join with all the other false doctrine. Like you were saying, what was it called? The turtle? What was that? But how did you say it exactly? The turtles down under? Is that what you called it? All the way down. Yeah, they build up on each other. Turtles all the way down. So the idea is here's a turtle in the sand and you start building your foundation on that and the turtle moves and then he moves a little more. It's all going to crumble. So they've built their whole religion on a turtle in the sand and it's crumbling. It only took 1500 years for people to wake up to that and started what they called the Reformation. A lot of people said, hey, that church is corrupt. And you know, many of the popes were a bunch of sinners. You ever study the Medici's and you ever study how many of the popes, their, their um, mothers were prostitutes? And uh, they paid to get their son in as the Pope. All this is found in history. Nobody wants to look at it. It's the elephant in the living room. But that church is so full of sin and wickedness. How could that be the church of Jesus Christ? All right. People are going to say, you're bashing Catholics. No, I love them. I want to see them get in the Bible. But that church tells them not to even read the Bible. I've gone to so many Catholic homes in Honduras and Mexico and in America and tried to sit down with a Roman Catholic and say, can I show you what the Bible says? And they said, no. Why? Because my church says only the priest can interpret that correctly. 
That's not even what the Bible says. It says no scripture is of any private interpretation. We have to go by what Jesus said. And we have to go by the Bible. We can't go by uh, a religion that crumbles because when you look at its foundation, it didn't even get who the foundation is. It's Jesus, not Peter. Okay? Whew. All right. Man, I made some enemies today. Amen. I've been getting in the mail several books from people that are Catholics that are wanting me to read their Catholic books. I'm reading them, but you're not going to convince me. Roman Catholicism is crumbling according to the scriptures. So back in verse uh, 20 now, then charged he his disciples that they should tell no man that he was Jesus the Christ. Now, why didn't he want them to tell that he was Jesus? Jesus is humble. Maybe he knew it wasn't his time yet. He's waiting for that time when they had the chance to accept him. But he says, don't tell him yet that I'm the Christ. Now, notice that it say I'm Christ. It says, I am the Christ. Why is that important? Because there's another Christ, the Antichrist. So if you just say, I'm Christ, how do you know he's not the Antichrist? But if he says, I am the Christ, oh, well, he's the one that's the right one. It's not that other one over here. So that's an important word, the. From that time forth began Jesus to show unto his disciples how that he must go into Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised again the third day. There's the gospel, death, burial, resurrection. Now, did they go, oh, that's, uh, boy, that's awful, but okay, Lord, whatever you say. Did they say that? Oh, wow, you're going to rise from the dead? Wow, I can't wait to see that. I mean, there's all these things they could have said. But verse 22 says, Then Peter took him and began to rebuke him, saying, Be it far from thee, Lord, this shall not be unto thee. <laughs> the first pope corrects Jesus. And you want me to follow him? Uh... No. What did Jesus say? But he turned and said unto Peter, Get thee behind me, Satan, for thou art an offense unto me. For thou savorest not the things that be of God, but those that be of men. So Jesus rebukes Peter and says, Man, what, you got Satan in you or something? You're telling me prophecy that I give is not going to be fulfilled? Really? Is that what you're telling He said, You're offending me right now. So what should we follow? Peter or Jesus? Jesus. Jesus. And he says, Thou savorest not the things that be of God, but those that be of men. If you look at the history of the Roman Catholic Church, look how big those churches are. Look how expensive. Have you ever been inside a Catholic church? Many of the Catholic churches have all these statues. I call them idols. And the Bible says not. And they're all plated in gold. You go to the Pope. You know, most of his clothes have threads of gold in it. Peter said, Silver and gold have I none. <laughs> The Pope says, I'm the richest man on earth. There's kind of a... Have you ever been to the Vatican? Some of the doors have gold on it. You, what is this? It's not the religion of Jesus Christ. It's somebody taking over that religion and trying to make this guy in charge and following him. So be careful. Be careful of that false religion. Okay. Now, verse 24. Now, does your Bible have a little paragraph mark in verse 24? Mine does. I don't know if yours does. But verse 24 to 28... Jesus says this, and it's all about taking up his cross. So Jesus prophesies of his death, burial, and resurrection, and then he prophesies of dying on a cross, all right here. That's amazing. So he knew what was going to happen to him. Then said Jesus unto his disciples, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it, and whosoever will lose his life for my sake shall find it. For what is a man profited if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? For the Son of Man shall come in the glory of his Father with his angels, and then he shall reward every man according to his works. Now, this, does this sound like Paul? Gospel? Salvation by faith alone? No, this is a works gospel. So is this for us today? Or is this talking about over here in the tribulation? That's what it sounds like. Verily I say unto you, there shall be some standing here which shall not taste of death till they see the Son of Man coming in His kingdom. That's over here when He comes into His kingdom. A lot of people will go to this passage and they will try to spiritually apply verse 24. Then said Jesus unto His disciples, If any man will come after Me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow Me. And they preach that for today. And it makes a beautiful message to come to Jesus, accept Him as your Savior, now pick up His cross and suffer for Him. But that's not what it's doctrinally saying. Doctrinally, Jesus is to Jews telling Jews, when you go through this and endure to the end, and like I died on the cross, you might have to die. 
And if you're still alive, I'm going to come back and you'll see me in my kingdom. So do you see how that's doctrinally tribulation that Jesus is talking to? That's what it's talking about. And what does it mean to take up your cross and follow him? There's a lot of things that we could get into here. Um, but in the tribulation, who's the guys that get saved? The ones that say no to the mark of the beast. Because if you take the mark of the beast and Jesus comes back, you're pitched down here into the lake of fire. So take up your cross. Jesus died on the cross. Die for me. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded in heaven. So how does that apply to here? Are we saved by works today? You've got to read your Bible. You've got to rightly divide. Now, I don't have a problem with people trying to spiritually apply that to today. But that is not doctrinally what he was saying. He was saying it to them here. Okay? And back here during their ministry. And you know, a lot of those early apostles died on the cross. You get Fox's Book of Martyrs. It tells you how the early uh, apostles died. You know how Peter died? They wanted to crucify Peter. And he was like, uh, why don't you do something different? Because so, I'm not... I'm not worthy to die the same way Jesus did. And he told him to turn the cross upside down. And he was head down on the cross when he died. That's how they killed Peter. There was another one. Was it Andrew? I think it was Andrew. They put the cross like this. Instead of like this, they put it like this. And it was an X shape. And he died on it like an X. So they literally died on their crosses like Jesus. So he's telling them. But uh, it's interesting. So we're almost done. We just have two more passages to go to. And let's go to Mark chapter 8, and we're going to read the cross-references to some of this, and then we'll be done. We can go eat. Amen. So it says here in Mark chapter 8, verse 27 through 38. Mark 8, 27. And Jesus went out and his disciples into the towns of Caesarea Philippi. And by the way, he asked his disciples, saying unto them, Whom do men say that I am? And they answered, John the Baptist. But some say Elias, and the others one of the prophets. And he saith unto them, But whom say ye that I am? And Peter answereth and saith unto him, Thou art the Christ. And he charged them that they should tell no man of him. And he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected of the elders and of the chief priests and scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. And he spake that saying openly, and Peter took him and began to rebuke him. And when he had turned about and looked on his disciples, he rebuked Peter, saying, Get thee behind me, Satan, for thou savorest not the things that be of God, but the things that be of man. And when, let's see, I want to go to verse 38. Yeah. And when he had called the people unto him with his disciples also, he said unto them, Whosoever will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Now, yeah, we can spiritually apply that today. But physically, that was to those people at that day and to the Jews in the future in the tribulation. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it. But whosoever will lose his life for my sake in the gospels, the same shall save it. What gospel is that? That'd be the tribulation gospel, it sounds like. And what shall it profit a man if he gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? Whosoever there for shall be ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation. Of him also shall the Son of Man be ashamed when he cometh in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. When does he come? At Armageddon. So you see how you cannot doctrinally apply that to the church? That's over here. But people try to spiritually apply it. Don't, don't do something you shouldn't do. Okay? Always understand. Always rightly divide. And if you're making a spiritual application, say, I'm making a spiritual application because this is doctrinally to the Jews. OK, now Luke chapter nine and we'll be done. Luke chapter nine, verse 18 to 27. Luke 9, 18 to 27. And it came to pass as he was alone praying, his disciples were with him and he asked them, saying, whom say the people that I am? So see how we're getting a little more details in every one of these. Jesus was praying at the time. They answering said, John the Baptist, but some say Elias, and others say that one of the old prophets is risen again, like Jeremiah. We saw that in the other passage. And he said to them, But whom say ye that I am? Peter answering said, The Christ of God. And he straightly charged them and commanded them to tell no man that thing, saying, The Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be slain and be raised the third day. And he said unto them all, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. Now look at that word daily. Well, there you go. There's some more of a spiritual application. Every day we need to get on the cross 
and, and uh, do what Jesus wants rather than doing what we want. Okay, so yeah, you can make a spiritual application. And for whosoever will save his life shall lose it, but whosoever will lose his life for my sake, the same shall save it. For what is a man advantaged if he gain the whole world and lose himself or be cast away? For whosoever shall be ashamed of me and of my words, of him shall the Son of Man be ashamed when he shall come in his own glory and in his Father's and of the holy angels. But I tell you of a truth, there shall be some standing here which shall not taste of death till they see the kingdom of God. Okay, so back to Matthew chapter uh, 16. I've got to finish with that verse. What does it mean? Some hear that until they see the kingdom of God. All right. What is that? Um, Matthew chapter 16, last verse. Verily I say unto you, there be some standing here which shall not taste of death till they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. There are some. Who were those some? Well, I only know one. Who was the one guy that didn't die until he saw Jesus coming? That's John the Apostle who wrote the book of Revelation. And he says he saw that. Now, was he in a vision he saw that? Or did God literally take him through time and show him? I don't know. But he wrote it in the book of Revelation. Now, who else? I don't know. I don't know. Somebody else got to see that and maybe in a vision or something that were there. But we know for sure John got to see that and he wrote the book of Revelation for us to see what would happen. No, they're not alive today like that Indiana Jones movie, right? Where they go and they find a couple and then, oh, look at these guys. They're a thousand years old or something like that. No, but Jesus is saying, hey, you guys are going to see this. And they probably saw it in a vision. If not, Jesus taking them through time and showing them and bringing them back like I think he did in, in John who wrote the book of Revelation. So any questions on that or anything like that? That was a lot to get through. Yes, ma'am. Do you think he meant that because Jesus uh, rises in on the third day and walk among them, that was the same way of the kingdom? Right. The kingdom. So there's the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven. All right. The kingdom of God is the spiritual kingdom. The kingdom of heaven is the physical kingdom. So when Jesus comes back at Armageddon and sets up the thousand year reign, that's going to be the kingdom of heaven because he came down from heaven and he's here on earth. The kingdom of God is a spiritual kingdom. So the kingdom of God is what we're in today and Jesus is inside of us. And so he's the king of our hearts, but he's not reigning in the earth. So you got to remember the kingdom of heaven, kingdom of God. So some people, they don't see the difference between the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God. So they're like, well, we're in the kingdom now. All right. Which kingdom? you got to know the difference between the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God. So that could be part of it, I guess. But um, that's a good question. Anything else? Okay. I guess you're all hungry and want to eat. Amen. I hope that was a blessing. Look quickly, though, in verse 1 of chapter 17. And after six days, Jesus taketh Peter, James, and John, his brother, and bringeth them up into a high mountain apart, and was transfigured before them, and his face did shine as the sun, and his raiment was white as the light. And there appeared unto him. So this is what we call the Mount of Transfiguration. That's what we'll look at next week. And Jesus was transfigured. So when they were there, they got to see a glimpse of what Jesus is going to be like over here after he raises from the dead. So could that be what it's talking about? That's the other thing, too. I've almost forgot to say, so I'm glad I remembered to say that. So next week's going to be really fun when we look at this. And there's a lot to get into. So, <sighs> all right.